Now, uh, before I start with the, the actual presentation of the policy itself, uh, I will spend a few minutes with respect to the relevance of education in the present context. A lot of things have been asked to me in public with respect to why at this time an educational policy, what kind of relevance does it have in the context of India and in the context of the global uh, developments. And always you have to articulate some aspects of it. Of course, first we all recognize there's more than three decades since we had the last one and there are several developments that have happened. India, of course, will have the highest population of young people in the world over the next decade. And we recognize that nearly 50% of the population will be below 35 years of age, aspiring for high quality education. This democratic dividend certainly has to be taken advantage of. I don't think we have discussed it in several platforms. We have debated it, and uh, certainly this is a direction and aspiration for the country which we have to realize. Globalization and demands of a knowledge economy and knowledge society call for emphasis on the need for acquisition of new skills by learners on a regular basis for them to learn how to learn and become lifelong learners, a critical consideration to be addressed appropriately. And that is where this education policy certainly has focused on. Changes in knowledge landscape, especially science and technology, I'm going to have to say here, would advances in big data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all demand skilled workforce involving mathematics, computer sciences, data science, as well as multidisciplinary abilities across the sciences, social sciences, and humanities. The education of future need to be reconfigured in order to meet the goals of the global education development agenda. We are a part of that. The goal four of the sustainable development goals four of 2030 that seeks to ensure inclusion and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning uh, for opportunities for all. So this is broadly that just to give it kind of a flavor of the kind of consideration probably the the people who matter in terms of defining when to come out with a policy uh, thought about uh, now how did we go about uh, a little bit of that also is of interest for, for the audience here the process of course was that we had the members of the policy committee with the government set it up and then we had a members of a drafting committee we thought that besides the policy framing we also need to bring it up in a way in which it can be presented. We had a special drafting committee, it had members of the policy committee also. And then we had a set of members, experts, who provided a kind of a technical secretariat support for doing this and not to be satisfied with it. This is where I have my own strong views. Uh, the question of being independently evaluated with respect to the type of presentation we are making, ideas that we have created, and the strategy we have uh, crafted. Uh, we put certain peer reviewers, people who are away from the policy formulation, who are very well aware of the kind of educational system, the academic system this country uh, over the years, and uh, therefore competent enough to give us very vital inputs about the first level of drafting this policy. So there were peer reviewers here. The discussions and consultation, we, did, we, we went through a period, even though this particular policy was initially having a basis of previous policy document back four years of work at very intense work had gone through in the formulation of this policy earlier itself documentation from downward consultations were there submissions from individuals and groups were there so there was the previous honorable minister of education uh, we had also the tsr subramaniam committee and many others so we had many things to fall back on the question was to review them to adopt them and to see where we need to move extra, extra efforts. And that is where we saw the discussions and consultations with the different stakeholders, including organizations, institutions, and individuals. Uh, we had quite a number of inputs which were new, which had very unique in terms of things which were not earlier presented or considered for discussion. And of course, when everything was ready and when we made up an initial presentation uh, to the ministry, uh, they felt that ultimately to go into the public domain is a national, uh, very important national document. We need to get the public responses of what they are in for, for the future of education. Uh, we got more than two and a half lakh responses from both in the, from the school and the uh, college education, higher education point of view. So that was another major thing. We went through a consultation with the state educational authorities, including in many of the states, we had also consultation with the state ministers. 
and then we had a review so that when the policy was in the near final stages the number of reviews were con conducted by the honorable prime minister himself in fact he went through every aspect of the policy and every item of the policy and he wanted to make sure that there is a level of pragmatism and the ability to carry this forward in the implementation domain. So this is one of the important things that the Honorable Prime Minister did. He came out with several interesting suggestions also, I should mention. So that is the other part of it. And finally, we got the cabinet approval on the 29th of July, 2020. Immediately following that, for a number of major, the first and foremost was to make sure that there is a very intense familiarization process uh, for this. So major conferences with chancellors, vice chancellors, directors of higher education institutions, other high-level functionaries convoy, were convoyed. These are meetings convened by UGC and Ministry of Education and addressed by Peer, Honorable Prime Minister and His Excellency, the President of India. So these were kind of things that were also carried. This also underscored the importance at the highest level that they attach to the policy. And now we are in the stages, and I will say at the end of my talk, a little bit about how, we, how the concerned agencies and the ministry is moving towards the implementation. Now, to just to give a framework for the policy, the policy provides an integrated and flexible approach to education. It has kept the interconnectedness, the various phases of education in mind, and how the same will enable continuity, coherence, and processes to ultimately realize an end-to-end -end educational map, uh, roadmap for the country an articulation of a broad view of education encompassing the holistic development with special emphasis on kindling of the creative potential of each individual in its richness and complexity has grown increasingly popular in the recent years several domains of discussions the policy thus aims to have it aims at the development of the 21st century skills. I don't have to re-emphasize what the 21st century skills are here for the students while giving through, giving them the flexibility, making choices consistent uh, with the dynamics of a knowledge society. Before we go high, straight into the higher education and go into the details of the same, a little bit about the connection between the school education and the higher education. We do recognize all of us and the policy does so. Uh, the interconnectedness of the various phases of education. I mentioned it earlier. School education is of intrinsic importance. There's no question. How a student experiences the schooling phase of education could have a significant influence on those subsequently pursue higher education, including professional and vocational, besides, of course, helping to lay the foundation uh, for lifelong learning. So keeping this in mind, I'm trying to first put the overall policy element, the element that is gone into the policy uh, as a part of the academic side, in not just one of the governors and other areas. We have the early childhood care and education, home education, and bodies and preschools. Uh, one of the very key elements, because we did make transformatory recommendations in the context of the early school education. I will say a few words about it in the subsequent projection. The found and right now it is divided over a 15 year period of foundational, preparatory, middle, and secondary. We'll see the details of that. On the higher side, of course, we have the undergraduate, general education, teacher education, professional and vocational to focus a little bit. And then we have the postgraduate, masters, and PhD, not to be not need not be emphasized here, and ultimately a national research foundation, a unique institution that will spur the research, and particularly in the educational institution and university system particular. And then, of course, we have areas like lifelong learning, adult education, and many other areas that have been also including the use of technology for education. These are all part and part of So this is just the broad elements of the policy uh, which you have touched upon in the policy. And I will, of course, as requested, I will try to concentrate on the higher education, but not before saying a few words about the kind of things that we have thought about in bringing the school education to a new domain. The extent 10 plus 2 structure is what the early school education will be. It will be modified with a new pedagogical and curricular restructuring of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 covering the ages 3 to 18. The, 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 we, I have shown it here in terms of four levels. The, the foundational level where the policy, this is the, the education starts unlike at six years, now it starts at three years. Three to eight years is what we characterize the first five years as the foundational 
phase of the educa school education, three years of pre-primary, preschool, and then we have a primary education, which is first and second class, the grades. So you have the five years here. What is important in this phase, which will take you up to the age of eight, is the fact that the policy recognizes the individual differences in the cognitive development of children at this stage, and therefore formal structured learning will be absent during these five years. So the important thing is that each child has to be evaluated with respect to its growth uh, of the brain. And these are not uniform, so there is no linear pattern in which the, the growth occurs. And it's also important that 85% of the brain virtually is immatured by the age of eight. So we need to make sure that the learning process is suitably adopted, that maximal advantage of this kind of a pattern by 85% by the age of eight is whether it is language learning, whether it is literacy and numeracy. These are all critical elements in this phase of the uh, foundational phase of the school education. This you carry forward a little more from unstructured. You go into the curricular structure in the next three years, that is from age eight to age 11, where the curricular structure and standardization can be slowly introduced. And taking, carrying this forward for the next three years, uh, you virtually go into sub subject areas. You have a teacher children, uh, the student interaction much more effectively and also have the capacity for abstraction because that is something which was the earlier two phases much less because of the nature of the brain growth. And lastly, we have the secondary education, the last four years of school education, ages 14 to 18. There will be multidisciplinary orientation with exit options. This is a phase that will prepare the student for undergraduate program. And that's why I'm coming to this because undergraduate program is very much related to the kind of orientation in the policy that we have tried to create in the secondary level of the school education, including early introduction of liberal arts education. So this is the kind of thing. Of course, you have vocational education here. You have the exit option here. If you want to leave at the age of 18, the school education and take up some kind of a job. There are enough provisions for that, enough training and other kinds of things. In fact, we have recommended that we need to have a youngster who knows at least one vocational area thoroughly, 100 percent, in the time he leave the school, that kind of thing. And the first four elements of the vocational education and the overall the scheme uh, is a part of the secondary and part of the middle, middle as well as the secondary education. So this is the broad thing. Uh, I thought I wanted to emphasize this mainly because these are the times and we understand today the neural sciences and the kind of cognitive science which dictated this study of uh, creating a policy around the present understanding of the brain and its growth. And I thought I should bring it to the attention of this erudite audience. And this is just to give you an idea of a brain, how critical it is to make sure that we make use of the, the, the brain and its, and its stimulation the early phase of the child's growth. And one can see very clearly the cognitive stimulation, what it does to the brain uh, to a case where we, such a simulation has not occurred. We can very clearly see the temporal lobes, how different they are in terms of its uh, uh, growth and maturity. And which essentially means the how much you take advantage of the pattern of the brain growth in terms of the learning process uh, and also the teaching process. Now, having said all this with respect to the school education, we move over to the um, undergraduate education, part of the higher education. What the policy does is to promote a holistic. We have made a broader approach, which is holistic and multidisciplinary at the undergraduate level. And this is something which is not new to this audience. And especially, I don't know, IIT Delhi is some of the very early efforts in the context of holistic and multidisciplinary education. Uh, they generate more imagination and creativity in the student to ensure their all-rounded development. And of course, the concept which we today turn as a liberal education, which is really multidisciplinary and holistic, is an age-old idea in the Indian context. Uh, I don't have to say this again, the Banabata's Kadambari, which is considered a person was recognized as truly educated when he mastered the 64 colors encompassing music, dance, painting, culture, languages and in addition to subjects such as science, engineering and mathematics, as well as vocational subjects. Liberal education explores the remarkable relationships that exist among the sciences and humanities, mathematics and arts, medicine and physics, etc. And more generally, 
the surprising unity of all fields of human endeavor. A comprehensive liberal education develops all capacities of human beings, intellectual, aesthetics, social, physical, emotional, and moral uh, in an integrated manner. So this is the approach, and this is the one we have tried to translate in the policy as a crucial step to lead India into the 21st century. The fourth industrial revolution, multidisciplinary education is central. Even engineering schools, I, I know IIT is following this, in this case, will move towards more holistic multidisciplinary education with more arts and humanities. Well, arts and humanities students will have to learn to aim more science, while well, all will try to make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills. India's rich legacy, I mentioned about Barnabatta's work and many other kind of work subsequently in the arts as well as in sciences and beyond will significantly help in making the move towards such an education, hopefully an easy and natural transition. Now, how is it that the policy has put that in the concrete terms? Liberal education with broad multidisciplinary exploration, it has to be an imaginative and flexible curricular structure, creative combinations of disciplines of study, this has to be chosen, whether it's arts, crafts, um, sciences, mathematics, one has to see the, how do you create a you know, creative combination, this has to be all worked out. And multiple exit and entry option is another important feature of the undergraduate education. And master's and doctoral education will provide the service specialization as a part of the higher education. The three to four year undergraduate zone with multiple exit option. The four year program is the main recommendation in terms of the undergraduate program. Undergraduate degree will encompass, of course, liberal arts, multidisciplinary and holistic education. And then you have the chosen major and minor concept that is there. We have the vocational subjects and later on, even professional education will be brought into this kind of undergraduate education, which is a four year. The three year program, which is currently very much there, will be retained with the necessary changes to bring in more holisticity and interdisciplinarity. Both the three and four year programs lead to a degree with honors with research work. So that is another thing that when, so there is a provision for research work in the, the, the undergraduate program, uh, which prepare on one side, it really enriches the uh, youngster on the other side. We certainly have a better preparation for the higher education and ultimately exit is provision does exist with a two year diploma in the uh, with a two year diploma at the end of two years of undergraduate and a one year certificate at the end of the first year of the undergraduate education. These are all drawn in a way in which there is enough provision for the person when he exits, uh, he will have an appropriate kind of a professional career which can be chosen. And this is a preparation that you try to do in the first year and second year of the undergraduate education with the proviso that in case in the later years, you want to come back to the education with certain provisions with respect to the preparatory part of the uh, entry. Uh, you can still continue your education to a third year or a fourth year or even higher education, part of the postgraduate education. This is also kept as a flexibility in the system. On the master side, two years for those with a three year undergraduate degree, one year with, for those with a four year undergraduate degree with honors and an integrated five year program is the three kind of flexible way in which you can go towards uh, master education. Next one I would like to bring is the integrating <clears throat> professional education. Uh, regarding the integration of professional education with general education, the policy aims to take a holistic view to the preparation of professionals by ensuring broad-based competencies and understanding of the social human context, a strong ethical compass in and addition to the highest quality professional capacities. There is something holistic about the recommendation that we have made. I'm sure most of the professionals are very aware of this particular part of it, especially the IIT faculty and the academics. And, uh, but we have made a strong pitch for this because we think many of the higher education institutions, especially the university system, certainly need to address this much more seriously than what has been done so far. All institutions offering either professional or general education must be organically evolved into a multidisciplinary institution offering both by 2030. 
the overall higher education sector will aim to be an integrated higher education system, including professional and vocational education. Thus, this approach will be applicable to all higher education institutions across the current streams, which will eventually merge into one coherent ecosystem of higher education. This is ultimately the objective by 2030-2035. There is certainly a time frame. It's not easy to make this kind of transformation. But we think that we need an integrated professional education as a part of an overall higher education. Now we come to the quality higher academic uh, research in the fields. I can, I don't have to carry coal to Newcastle by giving you why we should do research, but uh, put some numbers here just to see that the situation in our country with respect to research, whereas IITs and those Kaisers and things like that, you have. Uh, tremendous uh, research and vibrant activity going along with the teaching. The broader question of the university systems, both state and the central, we, I think we need to do quite a lot. Even though we do address this question of a quality academic research in the overall context of higher education institution, we would like to particularly make this policy focused on educational systems in the university and many of the state universities and other private and some of the other private universities certainly has to review this in the context of the type of recommendation we have made. And uh, we, we do know the importance of the European Union <coughs> estimate that two thirds of the economic growth of uh, Europe during they came the research. You, you had also, you know, if you really look at the European accomplishments in the research and innovation, I was just trying to look at some of the details. 15% of all productivity gains in 2000 to 13, and that an annual increase of 0.2% of GDP in R&D investment result in an annual increase of 1.1% in GDP, a five-fold return for the type of outcome that they were getting. If you look at the present research and innovation investment in our case, 0 0.7 point, we can keep debating on that. Uh, one has to compare it with respect to something like 2.8 in US or 4.3 in Israel or South Korea. Uh, these are the kind of which are three times the proportion of GDP. And this low level of investment certainly meant the number of researchers in India per lack of population is just 15. Your numbers are 400, 800 kind of numbers. We talk of US and Arizona as an example. Other than in fact, I don't have to again emphasize low levels of patent application and scientific publication. So these are the kind of thing. And certainly it was a very important agenda in the annual discussion with regard to propagating research in the higher educational institutions. And so we have spent a considerable space and time to make sure that we have some very tangible recommendations on promoting this. Now, how have we tried to recommend it? We have tried to recommend the creation of a national research foundation. It is put the it is based on the fact that the policy will put emphasis on catalyzing and energizing research and innovation across the country in all academic disciplines, with particular focus on the state universities and colleges. I said that in the beginning, and that is where really the lacuna does is, and they are serious that too. A fund to seed research in all universities and colleges so that synergies between the research and quality education can be leveraged maximally. NRF will fund across all disciplines, it's not only in engineering, and also it will expand the research and innovation at all universities and colleges, including private institutions. Uh, we have not made a distinction between private institutions and public institu public funded institutions. And the criterion will be, of course, the merit of the proposal and the kind of capability to do research and the type of outcomes. And we need to make sure that they get the benefit of a funding system where uh, this can be pushed further. Uh, after all, they also educate Indians and many other people depend on the private institutions for education. The NRA will have the provision to cover many themes, science and technology, social sciences, arts, humanities, and many more. In the scope, of course, everybody understands funding research through a competitive peer review process, building research capacity at academic institutions across the country through mentorship. There are very specific recommendations we have made regarding the mentorship, the type of bringing in 
people with who are veterans of research who are at, the, at this time available for guiding research in these kind of institutions who can spend some time doing research guiding research uh, and also establishing uh, the capability to conduct research uh, in these kind of institutions and then create the beneficial engages between the researchers academy everybody talks about this and disseminating research through seminars which is the other aspect of uh, doing research so these are the kind of things this is just to give a little brief summary a snapshot of the kind of thought that we are putting into the national research foundation we think this needs to be established and this is also going to be we had of course in our mind uh, it's like the national research foundation of usa there are models of establishing this kind of a system uh, which has which, which really becomes uh, a place where they address the excellence the relevance and the kind of outcomes uh, with respect to research and this has had a very strong influence uh, on the support of uh, research in the educational systems in many of the advanced countries and particularly if you look at the models like us and europe and the other aspect that we have addressed is question of the energized and educational capability faculty we have done we have spent uh, uh, devoted considerable space with regard to the questions of the faculty uh, quality and engagement of its faculty and uh, virtually we can say the faculty is put back at the heart of the higher education the rampant practice of contractual appointment one issue very heavy teaching loads these are all may not be applicable to institutions like iits but this is these are anyway i don't have to emphasize these aspects of it with respect to the broader issue of higher education the infrastructure support most faculty do not even have a structure faculty recruitment and development plan so we have gone into the details areas like recruitment development plan career proposal pro progression compensation management every part of the institutional development plan should carry this in the higher education appropriately designed a permanent employment tenure track system for the thing in by 2030 autonomous faculty empower to make curricular choices conduct assessment of students infrastructure for continuous professional development these are other aspects of it and appropriately designed bridge courses for mid-career professionals uh, to get into teaching uh, that's also available so that if anybody wants to get into the teaching profession uh, from another area where you need to facilitate this by the appropriate bridge courses that can be worked out the one of the important things that we have tried to do is to consider the school education and the teachers for the school education one thing we found that the existing system the school education doesn't meet the type of standards and the type of things that we need to have as a background for teaching at the school level uh, by the conventional educational system uh, providing teacher education what we have tried to do is to move the school education preparation will be done in the multidisciplinary university departments of education will be set up in many universities to offer a four-year integrated state specific BED. The whole idea is to bring in BED as one more of those undergraduate educational uh, stream, one of the undergraduate educational stream. Put it at a par with the other professional educational themes as well as the mainstream education. So BED will be an undergraduate program of study covering both disciplinary and pedagogic teacher preparation courses for each stage of education, foundational to secondary. All subjects, including arts, sports, vocational education, they will be mainstream. On par with other undergraduate degrees, gradually the four-year program will be eligible for master's and PhD programs. And the current two-year BED program will continue till 2030. But, but after 2030, only those institutions who are capable or who are qualified to provide a four-year teacher education can offer the two-year teacher education. So we want to make sure that the standard, the quality, and the excellence that is intrinsic to defining the teacher education and preparation certainly it takes into account through the higher education uh, systems overseeing the teacher preparation and education. Two-year program will be used for lateral entry of school teachers. There are also many interests in the you know, people becoming school teachers in the, in the lateral mode specifically designed courses in the pedagogy for mid-career professionals to become faculty will also be introduced. And I don't have to say substandard and dysfunctional uh, teacher education, you know, thousands of them have been already shut down. And this need to, this is recommended to be reviewed. Either they move towards um, institutions like the degree giving autonomous colleges 
or they close down or move over to other areas where the teacher education is not the main focus for these institutions. Something on the educational technology, Professor Rambopal mentioned about this with respect to the Prime Minister's this thing. We have addressed the questions of integrating technology at all levels of education. There is a very specific section where we have discussed this. I don't think I need to go much into the details of this. Again, the questions of four broad categories, the well-known improving teaching, learning, and vision, and supporting teacher preparation, continuous teacher professional development, enhancing educational access to disadvantaged groups, streamlining educational planning, administration, and management, and teacher training for the trade, the edutech is critical. And towards this, I also bring in some uh, example uh, where improving teaching, learning, and evaluation as a part of uh, the educational systems resilience during the recent crisis like the COVID-19, the online education, synchronous mode, live interactions, and asynchronous mode, blending high-quality pre-recorded content uh, rapid feedback with automated smart evaluation. So these are the kind of things on the improving the teaching and learning and education. Example regarding the supporting the teacher education and continuous teacher professional development. You have the recommender systems for content and certifications. Just another example in the COVID-19 scenario. The enhancing educational access to advisor advantage group. Connect the few specialized teachers to virtual classrooms of learners with specific needs. Must, want, must address the digital divide. That is the biggest problem with respect to the implementation of some of the, the digital divide. And certainly this is uh, it to be seen. Now streamlining education, planning, ed administration and management. We are also trying to set up as a part of this a national repository. There is, a, there is a national repository of educational data to track progress in achieving educational goals. So this is just to give you a gist of the kind of thing that we have gone into details uh, in the policy on the questions of educational introduction. But uh, equally important is the fact we have tried to create a kind of a, a setup. Uh, it is not any um, a, a, a creating a lab or it's not creating a facility, but it's a kind of a forum a national educational technology forum uh, which we have recommended to be set up with the following rules to provide in the, but the reason why we thought about this kind of a body uh, in the context of choices in the context of selection in the context of a research in educational technology in the context of adoption of educational technology from other sources of technology the reason why thought is the the moment you throw open an edu technology as a facilitator for certain type of function, whether it is related to education or many other areas, it could be even to deal with uh, energy from the waste. The, the type of technology and the type of options that that will be available are enormous, and most of the time, the ability to make choices is one of the biggest problems that we see. Uh, the questions of when ISRO did work related to a national. Um, the, 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 what you may call as a developmental program where you wanted to bring educational information to remote areas. The choice was to make sure that we create educational material. But what were the materials? Those materials had to be researched whether it is appropriate for the tribal population is going to receive, receive the material. The two to three years of research work was needed before you could decide what the educational material and the technique of reaching the local population who will receive those ideas and they will get enriched themselves in the process. This is a major challenge. This is one of the kind of example that if you want to proliferate the technology, you need to have a means of studying it, understand, evaluate, and regulate it. That is the idea that National Educational Technology Forum that we have tried to set up to provide an independent evidence-based as, well as advice to state and governments on adoption of technology-based interventions to build intellectual and institutional capacities in educational technology, to envision strategic trust in areas of technology domain and to promote education in them among educational institutions, and to articulate new directions of research and innovation, the use of technology for improving education. We would assume that these kind of things, also the actual activities on research and things will be carried out by the Department of Education which will come up in the higher educational institution, at least some of the higher educational institution. 
So the National Educational Technology Forum will maintain a regular inflow of authentic data from multiple sources, including the educational technology innovators and practitioners, particularly at the grassroots level. Disruptive technology, I don't know, this, is, this is something you're very much uh, day to day, you're seized with. The 1986-1992 policy could not expect the internet's disruption. This policy fully expects the educational system to face many technological disruptions, artificial intelligence, machine, machine learning, and so on. Two major aspects related to such disruptive technology we have identified, harnessing technology to improve educational outcome, that is human plus artificial intelligence, hybrid interactive systems, education in new and disruptive technologies, identifying them and preparing students in new large numbers. And finally, the project addresses both these kinds of a thing, the policy. Now, on the governor's side, I have just tried to, again, the, we got the policy in the beginning of my talk. I'm just coming back to the policy side and uh, what is the kind of a governance structure that has been done. Uh, I am trying to here show the, the state, state education and the central education in two to color codings. The, the blue is the color code for higher education and the yellow is the color code for this. And the main thing is the central agency for the, the, the education, the CABE, which is currently there, a council of uh, the educational uh, the thing. Yeah, I, I, the, the, this a particular CABE, um, the Central Advisory Board of Education, uh, is now in this policy, they have elevated uh, to the level that they will oversee the overall administration, governors, and evaluation of how the policy is going to work at the from the central level and also to make fine tuning or midterm corrections if needed and virtually becomes a kind of a a, a, a kind of a, a evaluate a reviewer and evaluator and also a recommender with respect to the changes needed in the context of higher education so this is the system which is adopting the central advisory board and making it more empowered then we have an higher educational commission of india which is what is recommended to be set it up as the highest body on the uh, higher educational commissions the, as a part of the governors you have the four major verticals that are there under the hcci one is the academic and standard setting which can be the peer the professional standard setting bodies and so on of that g is the general education council the national council of technical education the all india council of technical the medical ultimately they will all come under the PS, the professional standard setting bodies under the academic and standard setting. And on the academic side, you have, of course, the national higher energy qualification framework for higher education. And then you have the second one, which is regulation, the national higher education regulation, the regulatory body. And then you have accreditation, national accreditation, this the council. Then you have the funding, higher educational uh, grants council. So these are the four verticals under a higher educational uh, commission of India. This is what is recommended. And of course, the education provision will continue to be given by the autonomous institution and other types of institutions, which are a part of the higher education or the school education. So this is the kind of a structure, broad structure that we have tried to evolve with respect to the governance of the educational system and with uh, this clear delineation of the higher education part of it. Uh, important about this is the fact that empowered governance and autonomy of higher education. Uh, this is something which IIT, I don't think that this need to be much discussed in a place like IIT or IAC, but it's good to know that we have, this is one of the things that had can't be enough concern while they were debating on the subject uh, with several of the experts in this area. The recognizes the effective governance and leadership is the key to creation of a culture of excellence in the innovation of higher educational institution. All the higher educational institution in the next 15 years will become autonomous self-governing entities through a system of graded accreditation or graded autonomy. With appropriate graded accreditation, such institutions shall establish a board of governors consisting of highly qualified and competent individuals with proven capabilities and a strong sense of commitment, something which we need to do for many of the higher education institutions in this country. 
the board of governors will be empowered to govern the institution free of any external interference something everybody talks about it this is something very explicitly made clear in the policy make all appointments including that of the head of the institution and take all decisions regarding the governors the board of governors will be responsible and accountable to the stakeholders through transparent self disclosures so the relevant thing the board of governors to develop a strategic institutional development these are all there in many of the institutions long term medium term 5 years or short term 1 to 3 years based on the institution can develop educational and service outcome parameters for quality and capacity improve organizational and financial and human resource development plan to assess the progress so this is just to give you a flavor of what we have recommended uh, in the empowered governors and autonomy of the higher education so the most important aspect is the fact that we have strongly recommended the autonomy um on the governors on the academics as also on the finances now what is the kind of way forward before i conclude uh, the thing there are several things i did mention in the beginning of my talk that, uh, that there has been one of the most important step that was taken immediately after the government you know took decision on accepting this recommendation with necessary inputs from public domain and other sources is the fact that once they knew that there were a number of presentation there were a number of discussions or a number of seminars and other kinds of interactive system and uh, both uh, honorable prime minister and honorable president were involved in many of these i don't have to say that here many of you were there as a part of that particular thing so there is quite a lot that has happened in terms of sensitizing the policy in its do but certainly there are many things uh, which continue to be inquired about uh, clarify uh, seek clarification about and uh, not every some of them will come forward only when you try to do these things uh, you start getting a feel of the issues and that is where i said about the uh, mid mid term correction or fine tuning or better clarification or change of strategy this will be a part and parcel of this but by and large i find that this is understood by many of the policy makers and implementation um the related responsible people uh, the moe itself has done an action plan now they have done it i understand you know they have because i am telling this both this part of it more from the inputs that i received rather than trying to be a part of it but i i want to say that the moe has uh, certainly provided a good action plan which they have worked it out which has got something like 100 and out they have taken the higher education policy section they have looked at the Uh, various policy uh, items they have converted them into identified action plans and 181 activities have been identified with the time of frame him that it needs to do this under 16 broad themes this is what they have tried to do uh, we need to do this we there is a continuous churning of these ideas and some discussions are going on on this the ugc on its own has been also con- 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 organizing Uh, conclaves uh, for discussions on this particular thing and uh, then there have been lot of uh, the outreach of the policy to different segments of the uh, the, the 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 governor systems of the country uh, both the central and the uh, state has been another major feature of the recent uh, efforts uh, in trying to make sure that the policy is un- read understood and uh, then come out with uh, suitable strategies of implementation which are applicable because there are the local issues also one has to keep it in mind there is a broad strategy that we need to have for the country for the policy to be translated into the next step of implementation and also specifics with respect to the local conditions or the regional conditions and things of that kind which is more than just uh, the policy it's, it has got finances it has got the resources human resources and many other thing <clears throat> so this is and something on which work will be done but the fact uh, i would like to emphasize is and you know this again because you are a part of a system which is implementing it you know, that uh, this work is in the forward in the movement and i cannot but conclude with the statement that uh, as i said in the beginning i think this is a very unique policy it has its own challenges to implement but i think what is important and what is reassuring from some of us is the fact that 
many elements of this has been done in some form or other by institutions. And I mentioned about the IIT Delhi because of its pioneering role in areas like uh, multidisciplinarity and approach of science, technology, and policy, society, or more recently with respect to humanity and social sciences to be integrated into the undergraduate education. So these are things on which it is not that these are all totally new because of the policy, but there is much more uh, that, that, that has been done in, through the various actions and directions and visions of various leaders and in institutions of this country. I'm, I'm sure that we need to understand it very clearly. We need to see how that can be adopted and how this policy itself can aid in taking it forward. So with these few words, I would like to thank again the Institute, the Director, the Deputy Director and others for this privilege of talking to you and sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you very much.